Now it's time for some concluding thoughts on this class. Why does any of this matter? What are we doing with our lives? Well, this sort of stuff matters because real people are actually hurt by vulnerabilities, whether directly or indirectly. So for the developers, it matters because removing vulnerabilities from your code means you're not indirectly victimizing your customers or users. And for vulnerability hunters, because you're all good people, this matters because you can help find and get fixed more vulnerabilities faster than if the developers were just doing it themselves. So we're all working together. None of us are bad exploitation engineers or anything like that. We would never willingly victimize people. So the type of information we learned, right? It's vulnerabilities and it applies both to secure development and vulnerability hunting and exploitation. But let's return for a moment to something we first saw at the very beginning of Vulnerabilities 1001. This graph from Microsoft showing distribution of vulnerabilities based on statistics they collected from their software. And if we zoom in on this, we can see that this says their top vulnerabilities were heap out of bounds, use after free, type confusion, and uninitialized use. And hey, guess what? You understand those vulnerability types now. That's great. And indeed, you understand all these other vulnerability types as well. Stack corruption, heap corruption, use after free, type confusion, and uninitialized use, and heap out of bound read. That, of course, would be something like an information disclosure or info leak vulnerabilities. Yes, you understand all those too. And so you can see just with vulnerabilities 1001 alone, you had sort of limited insight into all these various vulnerabilities that were going on. But now you have a pretty good overview of the majority of vulnerabilities that account for all the things that Microsoft had in their statistics. And Google has published similar statistics that also said typical memory corruption type vulnerabilities account for about 70% of the bugs they've seen as well. So if you'll humor me and indulge me for a second, it's important because one does not simply teach type confusion. There's associations between all these sort of components. So you start off with a big jumble of information and you need to order it and you say, okay, I'll put it in this order. Well, how do you get to that order? Why that order? Why not some other order? Well, let's think about how this stuff actually works. If we look at stack overflows, we actually don't care whether we learn stack overflows or heap overflows first. So they could be learned in any order. But generally speaking, one would teach stack overflows first because it's nice and concrete about what the attacker's target of memory corruption is. Typically things like the return address on the stack, but of course also things like local variables, saved registers, and that kind of stuff. Whereas heap overflows are a little bit more hand wavy because you just have to say, eh, there's some sort of information that's adjacent and you're going to overwrite that and that's going to be beneficial somehow. But of course, that's all sort of invisible because you never know, just looking at the code, exactly what information will be adjacent in memory and it becomes an attacker's goal to craft and groom and perform heap feng shui in order to make sure they control exactly what's adjacent before the overwrite. So these two vulnerability types are essentially a exploit primitive for adjacent writes. Then after that, we cover something like out-of-bound writes. And why do we cover that after? Well, that is a exploit primitive for potentially more powerful write what where. So maybe it's adjacent and that you can, you know, go a little bit past the end of the buffer and write something. But maybe it's something where you've corrupted a pointer and now you have a write what where that lets you write anywhere into memory. And that's an extremely powerful exploit primitive. And we talked about how those can be either intrinsic, where they're just directly in the code, or they can be something that is actually manufactured by other vulnerabilities. So this implies some ordering, right? We want to know about stack buffer overflows so that we know that if a stack buffer overflow corrupts a pointer on the local variables on the stack, then the use of that pointer might lead to an out-of-bound write that itself is non-adjacent. It's not just directly writing immediately next to itself. So this gives us some sense of a implicit ordering requirement that if we want to get the most out of out-of-bound writes, we need to learn about stack overflows first. Then there's other topics like integer overflows and underflows, and the whole point of those is that they can cause these other vulnerability types. An integer overflow in and of itself is not actually that interesting. It's only interesting insofar as it causes a stack overflow, heap overflow, or out-of-bound write. Same thing with other integer issues. These are things like signed sanity checks, integer truncation, sign extension, 
really they're just sort of a grab bag of other things that can cause these same fundamental exploit primitives to become available, the adjacent rights and the non-adjacent rights. So that's our Vulnerabilities 1001 content, and that's a nice tight little bit of content, right? Those are all directly related to each other, and they form a nice little nugget, which is why we then put 1001 together. Now beyond that, once we get into the 1002 material, like OODA, well, the interesting property of OODA is that fundamentally what's it, what it's causing is ACID where there wasn't ACID to be expected. So there's uninitialized data access, and under normal circumstances, you'd think, well, that's just going to grab some garbage off the stack or heap. It doesn't really matter. It's just, you know, maybe it'll cause a crash. But the attacker's whole goal is to make sure that the uninitialized data that is accessed is ACID. And if it's ACID, then all of a sudden, these type of vulnerabilities can come into play. Unexpected use of some particular value could lead to an integer overflow, which could lead to a stack overflow, or it could just directly lead to a stack overflow. It all depends on the code. Then we move forward to race conditions, and race conditions have that similar property that they cause ACID to be used in the code where it was not expected. You read something, you sanity check it, time of check, and then you use it again later on, time of use, and it's acid on the second use. It wasn't acid at the time of check, but it's acid on the time of use. So this is another thing that has the property of acid where it's not expected in the code, and that means, yes, all sorts of those other vulnerabilities can come into play. Same thing with use after free. Now, all of a sudden, there's a bug in the code. It's accessing something that it shouldn't because that's freed data, but that free data will be manipulated by an attacker to become ACID, and sure enough, all the other vulnerability classes come into play. It's also worth pointing out that race conditions can cause use after free. We saw examples of that. And then there's type confusion vulnerabilities. And what is it? Yes, it's another ACID where ACID wasn't expected, and it's another can cause all of this type of thing. Now, an interesting thing about type confusion is that type confusion can cause use after free and use after free can cause type confusion. So how would use after free cause type confusion? Well, if you're using some data after it's freed and it's been replaced with some completely different type of data, well, then that could cause type confusion. But how does type confusion cause use after free? Well, the type confusion vulnerability could lead to an acid free and that could lead to use after free. If all of a sudden some memory just gets freed out from underneath some code. And just like race conditions can cause use after free, race conditions can cause type confusion as well. Sometimes it's by way of use after free and sometimes it's directly. And the last section that we covered was information disclosure. We talked about how that can be just intrinsic in the code and it's just automatically allowing you to read some information out of the thing without any sort of bug. But we also talked about how our stack buffer overflows can become stack buffer reads or heap buffer overflows, heap buffer reads, or out-of-bound writes, out-of-bound reads. And so all of these different vulnerability types can cause information disclosure vulnerabilities. We said that those are important because they help people make successful exploits in the presence of randomization mitigation, such as address-based layout randomization, stack cookies, and things like that. So great, with this picture in mind, knowing all of this sort of stuff, you see, this is the kind of thing that people know inside of their head, but they just can't, you know, summarize. Well, with all of this in my head, I said, okay, this is the right ordering of this class. We need to cover the stack overflows and heap overflows, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's fundamentally there is this, you know, relationships, things like race conditions. You have to cover race conditions before use after free because some use after freeze are caused by race conditions. So just getting this ordering was, you know, taking a little bit of work as well. I want to briefly talk about some inferences you might make based on the examples we used in the code and some misinferences you might make. So there definitely were a lot less user space vulnerabilities covered in 1002 than 1001, but we said before that that was because we were sort of biasing the material inside of like the type confusion section, for instance, because there's lots and lots of type confusion in user space. Don't get me wrong, all the browsers, every single browser, always has type confusion vulnerabilities, especially thanks to its JavaScript engines. And when you get other things that use JavaScript, things like Adobe Reader, those also have tons of type confusion vulnerabilities. But some of those were left out because, you know, there wasn't adequate pseudocode or they required assembly in order to actually read and understand them. Some of them are just a bit old. The heyday of Adobe Acrobat Reader exploitation was a number of years ago, so they're not 
fresh and new and I wanted everything to be fresh and new. So this is just fundamentally down to some selection bias on my part. And, you know, so don't think that these vulnerabilities aren't occurring in user space or anything like that. But then when we get down to the virtualization and firmware, you can see there's a lot more virtualization vulnerabilities in 1002 and a lot less firmware vulnerabilities. So does this mean that firmware doesn't have OODA vulnerabilities and doesn't have type confusion and doesn't have, well, we know it has race conditions because that's kind of all of the examples here. And there's a couple of factors at play here. Again, you know, there's many examples that are out of scope for these classes for now in the sense of I didn't want to use really old examples and have people think that, oh, this is old and doesn't happen anymore. I wanted to have new examples, but that did bias the results somewhat. But when it comes to things like virtualization, you know, do they have basic stack overflows, heap overflows? They do, but a lot of that kind of stuff has been hunted to death because good virtualization systems should have minimal attack surface and consequently attackers could go find the easy vulnerabilities, right? You saw that those kind of vulnerabilities in 1001 are a lot easier to find than these kind of vulnerabilities in 1002. So it's not that virtualization doesn't have stuff from the previous class, it's just that either A, it's older and it's been hunted to death in the past, and you know, you have to wait for new code to be introduced before those new vulnerabilities start reoccurring, or it's B, because of attack surface reduction and things like that. Now in the case of firmware, what I would say is that there's definitely things like OODA vulnerabilities and type confusion vulnerabilities waiting to be found, but because firmware is very often behind the curve, it means that most of the vulnerabilities being found are still the easy, low-hanging fruit of stack buffer overflows, heap buffer overflows, and the like. So essentially, researchers haven't had to do the find the more challenging examples of things like type confusion. Also, some things like use after free, there is an argument that could be made that because things like use after free depend on parallelism and shared resources, some of the parallelism sometimes is not as available in firmware contexts. So firmware A may be in parallel with firmware B, and so that could cause the issue. But for instance, a UEFI firmware at boot time, for instance, will start with only a single CPU core. So there's explicitly no parallelism at boot time. Now the vendors may decide to add parallelism to speed up boot and something like that, at which point these vulnerabilities could become more uh, available for exploitation. But when you've got just a single core, then some of the race conditions and use after freeze that are caused by race conditions and type confusions that are caused by race conditions, some of those start to go away. So again, you know, there's a lot of biases going on in the selection. You can go back and look at older vulnerabilities to make decisions for yourself how prevalent various vulnerability types are in different uh, execution environments. All right, let's do a whirlwind tour of the kind of stuff we learn in this class. What is uninitialized data access caused by? Uninitialized data. So common causes, not initializing local variables at declaration, not initializing heap at allocation time, only partially initializing things if you're going down some uncommon control flow path. What is the solution? Initialize all the things. We also talked and we saw a lot in this class how basically there's not as easy just simple heuristics in order to you know follow the acid flow and then boom, the vulnerability will just jump out at you. And that's why tooling becomes very important both for vulnerability hunters and for developers. The developers, of course, will know their code a lot better, and so they maybe will be able to spot these kind of things. But of course, developers are also responsible for maintaining other people's code. So they may not always know the code as well as they might need to in order to quickly spot these kind of vulnerabilities. So there's tools there, they help out. Things like memory sanitizer plus fuzzers, you know, these things are absolutely going to help you find vulnerabilities. Although some more than others, and in some cases, fuzzing requires customization to the bug type in order to actually find it. We talked about this nice eye of HAL for helping us remember how race conditions work. There's race conditions overall. A subset of race conditions are double fetch and time of check, time of use. Most of time of check, time of use, I would argue, are double fetch vulnerabilities, but there are some corner cases that are just race conditions because they don't really have an actual double fetch per se. Usually things having to do with something like shared memory where it's just changing out behind them uh, unexpectedly. When it comes to use after free, we had a couple of nice little animations about three common causes. AC-freezy, where AC means attacker controlled free. See, 
So if the attacker can free an acid pointer, and if they have, for instance, an information disclosure to let them know where to target, then they can just selectively pop that little bubble of victim data, cause any pointers that the victim has to that data to become dangling pointers, and then any sort of allocation into that space of acid, followed by subsequent use of that dangling pointer is going to burn the code. And we have our racy free, see? And that situation where there can be multiple things in parallel, all having pointers and references to the same data. But if one of those parallel entities causes a free or is tricked into causing a free, then all of those other references to that data are dangling pointers. Filling it in with acid is going to burn someone. And then there's the double free, see? Which is not the type of typical double free that cause memory corruptions inside of memory allocators, but instead it's just more of a logic buggy type thing where malicious code induces something to free some original data. But then because this code doesn't follow our best practice we learned in this class, free and null, it's keeping around this pointer P, and then someone else has some victim data that gets put into that. It doesn't necessarily need to be acid data because when the attacker comes along and causes a second free, then that is going to cause that to just magically disappear and cause that other victim code to have a dangling pointer, at which point if this gets filled in, it's going to be a bad time. Never want to access those, utilize those dangling pointers. But in this particular case, that victim code had no way of knowing that it actually had a dangling pointer. Whereas this code should have known that this freeing of P a second time was the use of a dangling pointer, and it shouldn't have done that. So I, of course, want you to feel about dangling pointers the way Damocles feels about his dangling pointer, the dangling pointer of Damocles. Type confusion, we talked about the common causes being design paradigms that allow a variable or struct member to be interpreted in different type depending on the circumstances. Now, of course, that's an extremely common design paradigm. Everyone uses data that has some sort of type definition and then the data comes in and they say, oh, what kind of data is this? Let me check the type. Well, that's a design paradigm that leads to the type confusion. And of course, object-oriented programming is just that paradigm writ large because there's an expectation that you can interpret something as a parent class or a child class. And so whenever code gets extremely complex and then they start saying, man, this code's too complex, we really need to make this object-oriented, well, that's a double signal that you could be heading towards type confusion vulnerabilities. We saw when it comes to C++ casting that three out of four casting methods are wrong and the one right casting method causes performance overhead and therefore people tend to not use it. So that's a problem, as is the fact that if you do an upcast followed by a downcast, that's guaranteed to cause a type confusion. Very common source in C++. And finally, what do I have to say about info leaks? I got nothing to say except that it's part of a perfectly balanced breakfast, as all things should be and your code is toast. So that's it for the new vulnerability types we learned about in this class. Once again, just to remind you, the whole design structure is predicated on the idea of a sploity sense. And the sploity sense is the sixth sense, the pattern recognition, the tingle at the back of your mind that occurs when you've seen vulnerabilities a lot. Whether you're a developer and you've you know, seen bug reports from past examples, or you're a vulnerability hunter and you're reading up other people's reports. Anytime you have repeated exposure to something, it helps strengthen your brain on that something. That's why we have the brain boosts in the class, and that's why you need to read lots of examples of vulnerabilities to develop your exploity sense. We've given you lots of examples in this class, but quite frankly, they're not enough. You need to read and see lots more examples. So hopefully over time, these classes will continue to grow. We'll do yearly updates or bi-yearly updates where we go ahead and put out some new examples that are fully explained for people. But in the interim, you know, you can learn about this kind of stuff the same way everyone else has had to learn about it everywhere else for the rest of history, which is just reading examples of other people's reports online. So we said throughout this class that it was intentionally focusing on vulnerabilities without focusing on writing exploits. That's intentional, that's by design, and I think it's better that way because exploit engineering is a different skill set. 
And fundamentally, the only reason we thought it was important to cover exploitation in this class is to help build credibility with you, the audience, so that you understand that, yes, sometimes a vulnerability may not look exploitable, but in reality, it just comes down to the skill and knowledge of the vulnerability hunter. Can they write the exploit? Can they chain together the various primitives in this weird form of software engineering? And indeed, it is just a special engineering. So I hope developers take from this the fact that, you know, just because something doesn't seem exploitable to you doesn't mean it's not exploitable. And therefore, you should just close any bug you see. And I hope vulnerability hunters who want to move on towards exploitation later understand that it's a weird form of software engineering means if you don't like software engineering, you're probably not going to like exploitation engineering. You know, it's just like a much harder version of it. And yes, you get to feel so cool, but that doesn't mean it's not still, you know, potentially annoying to spend days debugging something because your weird little write primitives aren't working. So finally, defense is possible, right? It's not guaranteed that the attackers are always going to win. Nothing ruins an attacker's day like a well-placed sanity check, but sanity checks have to be carefully evaluated you're not necessarily going to be able to just slap some if A greater than B in front of it and expect to come out on top. We saw in vulnerabilities 1001, things like signed sanity checks can be bypassed. And in this section, we saw how things like race conditions can just all of a sudden make it so it was good before the sanity check, but it gets changed after the sanity check. We saw in this class, even more so than 1001, the importance of tools for hunting bugs because not all of these bugs are just easy and obvious and going to pop out at you. So whether it's fuzzers for situations in which you're auditing a binary only, or whether you have source code, or sanitizers for those cases where you have source code, always apply tools, right? You should make yourself a superior cybernetic organism. And in this class, we saw how the mitigations that might have been fairly effective against the things we learned in 1001 are mostly not effective against the things we learned in 1002. So mitigations are there to make an exploiter's job harder. They make it costlier from an engineering perspective. The more mitigations, the more costly it is, the more the attacker may go after some other software instead of yours. But at the end of the day, they're always being bypassed all the time in the wild. No one anywhere has come up with foolproof mitigations that just close down all vulnerabilities everywhere. But defenders are, you know, making steady progress and making things harder and harder on the most hardened systems out there. But if you happen to be a developer who works in one of those environments like firmware that doesn't have a lot of exploit mitigations, you really need to get on that. So the final thought for this class, program paranoid, because it's not really paranoia if they are out to get you. So thanks for sticking with it. Thanks for getting to the end of the class. Thanks for leveling yourself up. I think we need more skilled engineers and we need more people like you who want to go off and learn this kind of material. So there's still more things to do. There's the in the wild hunt for after class, but for now, go forth, fix your code if you're a developer, hunt some code if you're a vulnerability hunter, take other information from open security training like assembly and reverse engineering classes and things like that and just skill yourself up. Thanks again. Have a good one.